that's possible, but not very likely. It's also possible that uh, Vladimir Putin just gives up and uh, signs some agreement with Zelensky and the Ukrainians and re re removes all the troops and they start rebuilding, which obviously would be very the best outcome. That's also not likely in the short run. I think the most likely scenario is one in which Russia just gets bogged down. They, they, Putin finds himself unable to reverse um, for whatever psychological reason, uh, and the Ukrainians will not give up. Um, and so you have this, this prolonged war. And that, um, that, in terms of economic effects, the biggest effect is on commodity production and supplies around the world. Um, the West has put sanctions on Vladimir Putin. It hasn't, you know, Europe, the United States has banned imports of oil from, from um, Russia, but Europe has not. And indeed, I think, you know, we've see, we saw oil prices get up to $130 a barrel briefly, and now we're down at about $100 a barrel. And I think the reason we're not higher right now is because people realize, well, Russia is still selling oil to Europe, and if it didn't sell oil to Europe, maybe it could sell oil to China. So there, there, it's not clear that we have um, you know, com a complete blockade of Russian commodity supplies, but there is a question with oil. Uh, I think there's also a big question for Europe with natural gas and natural gas prices have, have shot up. There's also a big question on wheat and, and food prices because Ukraine is a huge uh, wheat producer, as is Russia, and for many commodities, uh, production out of Russia, production out of Ukraine is going to be disrupted. So it's pushed up world commodity prices. It's added to supply disruptions. Uh, you know, I think it has differential effects. I think it's much worse for Europe in terms of its economic impact than it is the United States. But I do think that it raises inflation, prolongs inflation uh, around the world. So let me ask you a bit about what you think Europe's going to do. The U.S. has banned the oil imports from Russia. We are far less dependent on Russian oil supplies than Europe is. Will they be more pressured to impose similar sanctions if these horrific images of civilian targets happen night after night, or is it just not possible for them given their dependence? It's really not possible for them because of their dependence. And I think that they, I think in, in the, you know, in the capitals of Europe, they deeply, bitterly regret their dependence on Russia. Um, and I think it's going to be a big spur to uh, sustainable energy in Europe. I think the, there will be huge investment there. But frankly, if what Putin has done so far is not enough to cause the, the Europeans to say, we will buy no more oil, we will buy no more gas, it's really because they can't get out of that. And, and so they don't want to put themselves in recession because of this. I think I think it's important to realize that, that Europeans feel very strongly about this. I mean, we have millions of refugees streaming out of Ukraine to countries all over Europe, and they're being welcomed with open arms um, around Europe as people try to help the people of Ukraine. Um, all European countries feel very deeply about this, but they cannot do without that oil and natural gas. So, um, you know, I think that's, a, that's, that's an issue. What I think Europe will do is they will continue to help and support and arm the Ukrainians. I think they'll try and funnel every conceivable form of aid towards Ukraine to help them. There is also going to, they are also going to uh, establish funds for um, both uh, investments in clean energy and greater defense spending in Europe. I think it has galvanized NATO, it's galvanized the, the European Union to do that. And there is also the possibility of aid for um, energy uh, supplies and utilities so they don't have to jack up their bills. And this is very important because the biggest economic risk that Europe faces is that, you know, a lot of, you know, Europeans like Americans, like everyone, everyone around the world, a lot of people live kind of paycheck to paycheck. And if you have to spend twice as much on energy, you don't have money to spend on food or clothing or going out to restaurants or entertainment. And that was the real threat to Europe is that, the, that these higher energy bills would really push European consumers to pull back. And I think what European governments are trying to do right now is find, are there ways that we can prevent this from happening? And I think if they focus on that, Europe can avoid a recession, but it's going to be a close call. Well, one of the things clearly people are feeling here is rising gas prices off of that oil ban and gas, gas is now north of $4, right at a time when people are starting to commute back to work. Where do you see gas prices going and what do you think the impact of that will be on inflation? Well, we, we saw as oil prices get up to $130 a barrel and then come down to 100 If they stay at 100 let's just, uh, well, I'll get back to oil prices in a minute, but if they stay at 100 then I don't think that, nat uh, that gasoline prices will go much higher. You can, sometimes you have changes because of the blend of gasoline they use over the spring is more expensive than, than, the, than the winter blends. Uh, but 
I'd, I'd say the national average uh, for 430 to 450 is about right. But uh, you know, I wouldn't overstate the real importance of it. There's, there's a psychological importance. There is no price in America that's better known than the price of a gallon of gasoline. You, you can't drive two city blocks without figuring out the price of a gallon of gasoline. And there's nothing like it in terms of our consciousness. But the reality, the reality is that we spend about, back in, you know, back in, the, ni- when, in the Iranian Revolution, back in 1980, uh, we spent about 9.5% of, in- of our consumer spending was just buying energy. That's down to about 4.5%. So it's, it's, much, it's a bit smaller part of our, our budgets than it used to be. Uh, we drive more efficient vehicles. Um, uh, that helps also. Um, and then also, when you think about the overall economy, it's not just about consumers. It's also about producers. The big problem in the 1970s, and even, frankly, as recently as 2008, is that when, when gas prices went up, the American consumer was poorer, and the Saudis were richer, and the money just flowed straight out of the country. Today, when gasoline prices go up, the American consumer is poorer, but the energy companies are richer, and they invested in you know, drilling for more shale oil in the United States. So I think the U.S. economy is more insulated. It doesn't feel good. People are very aware of it. But I do think the economy can stand it. Can you talk a bit about what this might mean for investment in alternative energy sources, given now that the dependence on oil is not just an economic issue, it's a national security issue? And is there opportunity there both for investors and for the economy to to really create the kind of incentives we need? Absolutely. I mean, I think that you will see this very much in in Europe, and Europe is really a leader in alternative energy technologies, uh, but they are very determined to try to develop that alternative energy. I think you'll also see it here, though. I think that I think that people realize, first of all, global warming is real. We need global solutions to it, but it is real. And around the world, uh, leaders will, uh, governments will be implementing policies in the long run to try to tackle global warming. And so alternative energy is very important uh, to achieve that. Uh, but also, as you said, you know, we, we've been beaten up for for decades now by autocrats um, who decide to play the oil card and starve the West of oil. And that's something that, uh, you know, we're getting tired of happening. Um, and so I think in some ways it, it marries the interests of the sort of left and right in the United States where um, we have a national security reason and an environmental reason to do this. And I think you'll see very strong investment in this sector. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for investors in this because if there's a lot of government money, a lot of regulation favoring alternative energies, there should be opportunities for investors to invest in uh, the companies that are going to lead this change. Uh, So let's talk about inflation. I think at the highest rate in 40 years, do you think it will taper off? And do you see a situation where we could end up in stagflation? And maybe you can explain to people what that is. Okay. Uh, So first of all, I think it will taper off a bit uh, because as the year goes on, um, some of these supply chain issues will iron themselves out, even if we have a, a further problem in China. The reality is, when you've got a supply chain issue, you know you, you can't put the, uh, enough food, say, on the shelves of, of, the, of the grocery store. If you could, if you're the supplier that can actually do that, you make money. Anybody who's driving a truck today in America makes money. Anybody who's producing trucks makes money. Anybody who can figure out a way of unloading a ship makes money. Anyone who can bring more oil to market makes money, and that's kind of that's how the um, economic system system works. I mean, when you have a shortage of something, the price of that thing goes up, and everybody piles into to, to try to try to you know fill the gap. And so, I do think we'll see these supply chain ish- pressures ease as the year goes on, and that'll bring some inflation down. I think uh, the automakers will find a way of getting uh, chips to make new cars, and that'll bring the inflation rate down. But you know, there's some inflation that's transitory and there's some inflation that's sticky. And the problem is that, that inflation is a little bit like fresh paint. The, the longer it hangs around, the stickier it gets. A- and the longer we have these elevated levels of inflation, the more it embeds itself in wage demand, the more it embeds itself in people's expectations, the more people th- feel like they can raise their prices, they can raise their wage demands. Uh, and so I think we, we're now going to have a few years where inflation will be higher than it has been in the past. Right now, the CPI inflation rate is 7.9% year over year. I do think it'll be lower than that in a year's time, and by the end of this year, in fact. Uh, you know, maybe it'll start with a 4 or possibly a 5. Uh, but I think you know, by the time we get to 2023, we're probably going to look at inflation rates that start with a 3. The problem is the Federal Reserve wants a 2. And so it looks like we've, we've now 
we're in an era now where inflation is going to be running above that Fed, the Fed's 2% target, even if it's not going to be as high as it is right now. And what are some of the unexpected risks, maybe your potential risks for inflation? You and I have talked a bit about low unemployment and pressure on wages, which you just had brought up. Are there things that could end up driving it the other way? Well, yes. And, and uh, you know, sorry, I should first first answer, answer your other question about stagflation. Ah. Stagflation is, it's, it's, un, it's a very unusual thing. I don't think it's a, it's a very likely phenomenon. It's certainly not something that can last. Because if you think about inflation, I just talked about how the supply chains, they tend to fix themselves. Well, inflation tends to fix itself. If prices are really high, people want to produce more, it tends to bring inflation down. Similarly, if you've got a recession, you know, naturally, people want to work, people want to, you know, people want to spend, people want to grow businesses. So unemployment, high unemployment should also be kind of temporary. It tends to fix itself. Um, and when you've got both of them, both inflation and unemployment, they're actually operating a counter in, a, in opposite directions. So it's very hard to actually maintain very high inflation and very high unemployment at the same time. It's, 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 uh, you know, I, I wrote an article a, a few months ago on, on LinkedIn uh, where I sort of compared it to log rolling. You've got two people basically trying to knock each other off a log, and it's pretty hard to stay up there. And it's hard to get stagflation to last. So you could have... You know, it's great for the news media, you know, I mean, how, how scary can you get? Stagflation. But as a practical matter, it's not going to last for long. And I think what's probably going to happen is we'll have inflation peak and come down. I think for the moment, the economy looks like it can keep growing through this. But of course, as you say, there are risks. Uh, we could have another COVID outbreak in, in China. Something else could go wrong with the supply chains. Something could go wrong with the real economy. We could have a natural disaster. I mean, if the... And people always ask me about you know what I worry about and what the risks are, and, and the truth is, uh, you know, after many years of watching this, the answer is none of the above. Um, if you think about this this century, the things that really got us: 9/11, Lehman Brothers taking down the world, the pandemic, Ukraine. These are things that we really couldn't see coming. It's not the things that you know. I worry about the stuff that I don't worry about. And I think that's why you have to diversify, because you just don't know what's around the corner. So there are things, of course, that could lead to higher inflation, but it's probably something that neither, neither you or I or anybody else really expects right now. Um, do you expect additional fiscal stimulus from Washington? You had written recently about some interesting stats. It would be great for you to share with our investors mm -hmm. on the last 25 midterms and how people had responded compared to the party of the sitting president. That's right. I think the I think the chances for further fiscal stimulus are diminishing, and, and in many ways that's probably appropriate. I mean, the economy is is very close to full employment, but do recognize that we're moving from a period of huge fiscal stimulus to one where we're kind of going cold turkey here. Um, the The deficit of the share of GDP was fifteen percent of GDP. Now, the deficit's how much the government spends every year, less what it takes in in taxes, and it was fifteen percent of GDP. In fiscal 2020, it was 12.5% of GDP last year. This year, it looks like it's going to be about 4% of GDP. So it's come right down. And we want to see lower deficits in the long run. But the problem is, again, it's the deficit's the difference between the, the, the money the government puts into the economy in the form of spending. That's what it takes out in the form of taxes. So when you bring it down, you're actually sort of dragging on the economy. You're dragging on demand in the economy. Uh, the president has been trying to pass um, his Build Back Better bill, but he just can't get... Uh, to pass it, he needs 50 votes in the Senate, and he's only got 50 senators between the independents and the 48 uh, Democratic senators, and he just can't get them all to agree. And what's happened recently is you've seen, we've seen a bill passed which has extended the, or increased the debt ceiling by $2.5 trillion, so we're not going to have a debt ceiling crisis before 2023. We've now seen a bill passed to fund the government through the end of this fiscal year, um, so we're not going to have a crisis there. So there's no crisis really pushing them to do more fiscal stimulus. So maybe we get something over the summer. I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. It's been very hard, even when it seemed like it was essential to get it passed. And as you mentioned, then we've got the midterm elections. And in 22 of the last 25 midterm elections, going back over the last century, the president's party has lost seats in the House. In 19 of the last 25 midterm elections, the President's Party has lost seats in the Senate. The President's Party has only got a slim nine-seat majority in the House. It's got no majority at all in the Senate. So a Las Vegas bookmaker would say there are heavy odds 
that the Democrats lose one or other House of Congress in the midterms. And if they do, I think the chance of pu pushing through any fiscal stimulus between now and the 2024 presidential election is, is pretty slim. I think the big question that's probably on many investors' minds, particularly after all of the ground that you've covered on this call, is what should investors do now? Talked about diversification. That's always a standard, but are there are adjustments people should be making around their asset allocations, things to avoid or things to get into in your view. Well, there are a few things. I mean, the, the first point is don't try and time COVID in China or, or the situation in Ukraine. It's, it's not about you know, when you make a, a, a change, it's what you own is really what's important. It's, 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 all about, you know, it's all about how you're allocated rather than when you make a change. Um, I think the, the second thing I'd say is that recognize that interest rates are rising. That is the big change in the environment relative to the last 15 years, really. Uh, and if you've got these rising interest rates, it's going to hurt the most expensive uh, parts of capital markets. So maybe some of the mega cap growth stocks, but also things like cryptocurrencies, meme stocks, um, uh, some of the more speculative areas of investment. It's very, you know, when the, when the carrying cost of a crazy idea is zero, a lot of people invest in crazy ideas, but the carrying cost, the, the cost of funding these things is going up. And I think that's going to hurt the more speculative investments a lot. So I think it's important really to look at valuations. And when we look at valuations, uh, there's a big gap in the U.S. stock market. There are things that are, are quite expensive. There are things that are really pretty cheap. And so I think you have to look at value stocks in the United States. I think that's a good area. I think international stocks also are a good way to, to uh, think about investing right now. I know there are problems in China, there are problems in Europe, but uh, international stocks in general outside the United States are not expensive. Uh, they have not really participated in this big rally for many years that we've seen in the United States. And also, I think over time, the dollar will come down. And when the dollar falls, that amplifies the return on your international investments. I mean, all other things equal, the dollar falls 10% overnight, your international investments are worth 10% more dollars than the next day. So I think those are areas I would look to. But the, the, other, the one last thing I'd say is, I do think there's an opportunity for active management here. We've had a period where we've had tremendous uncertainty with the pandemic and now with the Ukraine. And then we've also had this, this abundant liquidity so you could really fund almost anything and that tends to cause sort of very lazy pricing the, you know some things get priced high and some things price, get priced low it's, it's almost like somebody turned off the light in walmart said at midnight when the guy with the price checking machine was putting price labels on it and there's just a random set of almost it looks almost random in terms of some of the pricing we see in markets that's all changing. I think as the, as interest rates go up, people are going to think much more about the value of things. And I think active managers who can really find companies that have got great businesses that will grow over time, which will generate more cash over time, I think those active managers will have an advantage over those who are simply passively following what is whatever is done well in recent years. Dr. Kelly, any last words of advice to our investors? Um, well, yes, I think, the, I think the one other thing I'd say is don't just think about how the world's changed. Change. Think about how you've changed. I mean, we've, we've gone through these last two or three years. And during the years of the pandemic, the market did very well. A lot of people are a lot richer than they were a few years ago. Um, and maybe they, you know, this is a great time to talk to your financial advisor about, okay, uh, you know, five years ago, this is what I want to do. This is the number we were trying to get to. This is what my plan was. But maybe your personal circumstances have changed. Your wealth has probably changed. And so I think it's a really good time to, to think about that. You know, there's a, there's a very old saying from a Greek philosopher that, that a man never steps in the same river twice because it's not the same river, but he's also not the same man. And I think that's really the point right now. We're coming out of this very difficult time. Markets have changed. The economy has changed. It's a different landscape, frankly, from the one before the pandemic. There are opportunities, there are plenty of challenges, but also I think a lot of individuals have changed in terms of their wealth, in terms of their goals, in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And this is a time to, and also the balance in their portfolios, if they let them run, they're, they're much, you know, they're very overweight some areas, underweight other areas, which wasn't the case a few years ago. So I think it's really a time not just to look at the world, but look carefully at your investments and make sure that those investments are matched up to your long-term goals. Well, the world has certainly changed both over the past year and even just in the beginning of 2022. And we're glad that we have you here to help advise us on, on how our investors should be planning ahead. So thank you, Dr. David Kelly. Thank you. Happy St. Patrick's Day. 
And thank, thank you. you to all of you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Prior to making financial or investment decisions, you should speak with a qualified professional and your JP Morgan team. This concludes our webcast. You may now disconnect.